Welcome to another great O'Reilly webcast. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's event. Today, folks, we have Andy Davies with us and Doug Sillers, and they're going to talk to you about what makes mobile websites tick. How do we make them faster? Andy is Associate Director for Web Performance at NCC Group, working with clients to measure and improve the performance of their websites. He recently wrote The Pocket Guide to Responsive Web Performance for Five Simple Steps, and he's the author of the soon-to-be-released O'Reilly Media book, Using Web Page Test. Doug Sillers has been a member of the AT&T Developer Program for the last 10 years. He is the Performance Outreach Lead helping mobile developers apply best practices for mobile performance. The tools and best practices developed at AT&T help developers make mobile apps run faster, use less data, and less battery. Folks, we're very excited to have Andy and Doug with us today to present this webcast for you all. As we get the event started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. First, you'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Andy and Doug. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Andy and Doug, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that it's for them, and we can make sure we see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you would like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. The Twitter widget will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today, folks, our hashtag is VelocityConf, all one word. If you have any trouble with the webcast, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have trouble, just post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. If you have any choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know we are recording today's webcast and we will have the archive ready, usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Andy and Doug for their presentation. Hello, gentlemen. Great, thanks. So, Doug, are you going to start for us? Have we lost Doug, Gizmina? I'm sorry, I hit the mute button so I wouldn't interrupt Yasmina while she was talking at the beginning. Sorry about that. Uh, good morning, everybody. This is Doug Sillers from AT&T, and Andy's on the bridge as well. And uh, we're going to talk today about what makes mobile websites tick and how can we make them faster. And we're using insights from web page tests and the HTTP archive. And so why are we concerned about the mobile web? Well, 85% of survey respondents said mobile devices are a central part of their everyday life. Um, last year, during the holiday season, over half of folks at Amazon shopped with a mobile device. And between Thanksgiving and Cyber Monday on the big shopping weekend, they sold five toys per second via mobile. Uh, the Marissa Meyer of Yahoo says, by the end of this year, Yahoo will have more mobile traffic than PC traffic. And one last stat is Etsy, 50 to 56% of their traffic is mobile. And so it's important to think about mobile because obviously that's growing and taking off. And mobile performance is really important because studies have shown that if you add 160 kilobytes of load to a page, you lose 12%. Of, of your audience, you get a 12% bounce rate. And if the site is slow to load, 40% will exit if the site loads in over three seconds, and 64% expect the site to load in four seconds. And then finally, my most 
My, my favorite stat of all is that 4% uh, of mobile users admit to throwing their phones out of frustration when their site is slow. So uh, when you see somebody on the train with a broken screen, it's probably the result of a slow website. Cool. So um, we used a number of tools to measure the performance of these sites. And the first one, as Doug said, is we used web page test. And you know, what web page test is, is a tool that will synthetically monitor a website. So you can load a website in it. It will give you a waterfall of the resources that that page loads. It will show you information on each stage of the load. So you can see the DNS resolution time, how long the TCP connect time took, how long it took to make the request and get a response back from the server, and then how long the um, response took to download. And one of the great things about web page test is, you know, it has desktop browsers, but it also has mobile test agents. So um, it's connected to real Android devices running a modern version of Chrome. Um, there are people who provide um, iOS devices on it. So you, you can test on you know, iPads, iPhones, um, and get some semblance of, of real world experience. And as well as giving you a waterfall, uh, it gives you a, a visual experience of the user, so it captures a film strip of the page load. And one of the things that we can do from capturing that visual image is we can create a metric called the speed index. And, and we'll, come, we'll come to a bit more about what the speed end index is in a minute, but it's used quite heavily when I'm judging performance. But the way we traditionally measured um, web page speed is we we measure how long did it take for the onload event to fire after somebody requested the page. And, um, you know, that's fine, but that's not when our user's experience begins. Our user's experience begins when they enter the URL, when they hit the go button, and they start to see the page being rendered before them as, as the HTML comes down, as the CSS comes down, the page starts, the browsing starts to render the page at that point, and then pull in the images as they want. So um, Pat Meenan, who runs Web Page Test, came up with this metric called Speed Index. And it's a visual measure of how quickly the initial page or the initial viewport starts to render. Um, and in the slide in front of you, you can quite clearly see there's a difference. Um, the top one starts to render much more quickly than the bottom one. And Speed Index is like an inverse measurement. So it's, it's lower is better. and the way that works um, is a line is a plot there's a plot made of from the when the page starts to render to when it's complete uh, as a measure of visual completeness and then what we do for the speed index is is take the inverse of that so that we get a a lower number is better and you can sort of see on the top two charts um, the visual progress is how much is left to go is the, the area under the chart. Um, and on the bottom, we actually use the area above the chart as a speed index measure. And what this does is it gives us a, a score effectively that we can use to compare websites. And that's what we did here. Um, then coupled with that, uh, Steve Souders, who was the founder of the modern um, web performance movement effectively, um, wanted to catalog how websites were built, how, whether how we were changing the way we build websites, whether they're getting faster over time, whether they're getting bigger, how they're changing. Are old techniques like Kufon disappearing? Are we moving to web fonts? Is SVG coming along um, as an image format and being adopted? And Plenty of people have heard about the um, normal HTTP archive, but there's also a mobile version. Now, the, the full HTTP archive has about 300,000 URLs in it. Um, the mobile archive is smaller with only 5,000 URLs. Um, 
what I haven't put on the slide here is if you want to explore the data for yourself and look at the trends yourself, is you get a mobile.httparchive.org, I believe, um, you can see the mobile trends. Um, but, you know, there are some, so the HTTP archive scans roughly 5,000 URLs. It's something like 4,700 and something. Um, it uses um, the Akamai Mobi test agent running on an iPhone that's in Dulles, Virginia. Um, and it uses a, a simulated 3G network. Um, so, you know, it, its download speed is 6 to 1.6 megs. Its upload is 768. And it's got 300 milliseconds of latency injected to simulate the characteristics of a mobile network. And, you know, as we all know, mobile networks are pretty high latency. Uh, LTE, so 4G, um, is around the 100 millisecond mark. 3G can be anything up to a 1,000 milliseconds. And it's um, latency that has the biggest impact on web performance. Um, so that's what the HP Archive does. There are some challenges um, in that, you know, there are, there are all sorts of sites in the mobile archive. Um, plenty of them are outside the US, in Russia and China, um, the UK, and they get some extra latency added. So this makes it a bit hard to um, compare sites and compare metrics. Um, and the iOS test agent is old. Um, it misses metrics like time to first byte. Um, it's a bit of a, uses private iOS um, APIs to capture the data. So it doesn't measure as well as the Chrome agents do now. And there are some discussions underway as to whether the, HTTP, the mobile HTTP archive should use the uh, Chrome agents instead because they can get much better information out of them and much fine grain of screen capture. And you know, finally, the, the other point with it is the data is very, very noisy as um, we'll come on to looking at some of the charts. So you know, typically the first thing we start doing with this data is you know, plot some histograms and look at how many requests web pages make, for example. So, you know, we, we know that more request, making more requests, particularly with high latency, um, slows down page load. And, you know, what we did here is we plotted a histogram of how many requests the pages are making. And what we see is, you know, there are, you know, below 25 requests, there are, you know, there are some sites making that low number of requests, but, you know, the peak, the median of the curve is somewhere around 50 to 75, you know, and there are people with mobile sites making 100 plus requests right up to the very end where, you know, there are some sites that are make 500 requests on a mobile site. Um, when I originally cut this data, there was actually one site that had made 818 requests. And when I looked at the, the data from multiple crawls, I could see that this one site had had a blip in the middle of April, where for some reason, their site had become terribly unoptimized. It had gone up in number of requests. Um, but they'd obviously seen that and brought it back down. You know, there are some real sites out there. So this is the Daily Mail in the UK, and it makes 500 and odd requests to load. They haven't got a mobile version. And, you know, it, it, I find it really surprising in this day and age that we still have major publishers who are not building or not optimizing for mobile when, you know, we're using our mobile phones more and more as our network connectivity gets better as mobile network coverages get better. You know, we don't sit on the train and read a book anymore. We sit on the train and play with our phones and read the news. And, you know, I find it really surprising that, you know, there are some sites that aren't optimized for mobile. And, you know, one of the things this brings with such a large site is it regularly fails. So this is supposed to be a trending chart over time of mail online. Um, and you'll notice that 
you know, there are lots of gaps where the test for it has failed. And when I was trying to generate a waterfall for this site, just look at it. It took me nine tests before I even got a working waterfall. Um, so, you know, I wonder how many people in the real world are experiencing this and you know, how much the Mail on Sunday suffering or sorry, the Mail Online suffering from losing advertising revenue because they're not dealing enough mobile optimized site. And, you know, this is I get the page. This is what the waterfall looks like for this site. It's uh, when the animation dog got too far when it comes. You know, it's a huge, massive waterfall, like a rocket shooting off into the sky. Yeah, so, you know, Sunday 8th of June, 764 requests, 9.6 leg download, and 80 domains. Um, you know, this is not a mobile experience we're delivering to anybody. And, you know, so what we started then is to look at who else had similar problems. And so um, if we start looking at how big mobile pages are, uh, this is a graph showing you know, the count of the number of websites versus the page size. And you can see in mobile that a great majority are under one megabyte, under the 1,000 kilobytes. 91% um, of all the sites are under two megabytes, but there are 87 mobile sites that in, the, in the HTTP archive that measure in it over three megabytes in size. And you know, as we showed with the previous slide, as websites get larger, there is also an effect of them getting slower. And so here is a graph of taking the page size in, in kilobytes and graphing it against the speed index. And so you can see that you know, there's a great number of sites that kind of hit that under 10 seconds. Um, it, it's very much focused kind of down here at the, at the bottom, in the bottom left-hand corner showing that, you know, the smaller the page size is, the faster it'll be. Unfortunately, there are also sites that are small in kilobyte size that are also very slow, and I've got that in the box kind of above 25-second speed index load time. The same thing happens with the number of requests. So the fewer the number of requests, the more likely you are to be fast, hence the concentration of sites down in the lower left of this graph. You can see there are sites that have a lot of requests that are, there, there are a few sites that have many requests that are sort of fast. I don't know if you would call them fast, but they do have a lower speed index than you might expect. But there are also a great number of sites that have fewer than 40 requests that are also very slow. And so we thought we would take a look at some of those sites to figure out what's causing these sites that are doing, you know, the, the theory is make your site small, make them have fewer requests, and you'll have a good performance. But what's going on with these sites here that have a low number of requests or a low number of bytes but are still slower, over 25 seconds to load? And so here's one example of a site, and I've tried to pinpoint the dot in the graph. And the problem with this site is it has a long time to first byte. And so this site to load, you can see this is a, a, a shot, a, a, a screenshot of the waterfall. And just getting the root, the index page, it took over 12 seconds for that to load. And so if it took 25 seconds for the page to load, nearly half of it is just starting up, getting that first HTML document downloaded and loaded so that the page can be processed. And obviously that is, the idea is you want that to be as short and as quick as possible. Um, here's a site that has very few requests. It has 14 requests. So this one isn't super slow. It came in at about 8 seconds speed index or nine, a 9,000 speed index. Um, but what happens when this site loads up is there are a number of redirects. And so when you type in the URL, it redirects you to the secure version, and then it redirects you to a mobile version, and you eat up 
in the first request, 900 milliseconds, and then 550, and then 450, you've eaten up essentially two seconds before you actually get to the, the, the request for the login screen. And so by optimizing the redirect, perhaps skipping one of them, you could easily pull off half a second or more of load time to this site. And by doing that, you will make the site pop down a little further into the lower left-hand corner of, of this graph. Um, and here's a site that actually has both. It has a low request and a low byte count. Um, but the problem that we see here is there's a whole bunch of scripts loading, and they're all shown here in orange. And each one of those scripts has to load completely before rendering can start. So these scripts are blocking um, the loading of, of this page. And there might be some head of line blocking as well. There's an image here that's shown in purple. It's request number five, I believe. And um, it's only, it's very small image. If I recall, it was under 10 kilobytes, but it took a very long time for it to load. So something happened with the connection, and it may have blocked some of these other loads. But when you load multiple script files, um, there's only so many connections that the browser is allowed to open. And by downloading all these script files, you're actually blocking the page from rendering. Uh, finally, I thought I would show you the opposite. And so this is a site that has a lot of kilobytes. It's 800 kilobytes. It has 163 requests. But, and of those requests, uh, this is a graph from, from the HTTP archive showing that of the 811 kilobytes, almost 500 kilobytes are script files. And so from the previous example, lots of scripts is going to make it really slow. In this case, it actually loaded relatively quickly, a speed index of 4,500 milliseconds. Um, so what did they do? What happened is the scripts were all loaded at the end, which is one of the best practices recommended. And when possible, they were loaded asynchronously, allowing all of the other files to, to render and, and let the browser process all of them. Now, that said, this is, really, this, is, this is a neat example of a site that has a lot of requests, a large amount of data being downloaded, but it loads pretty quickly. There's still room for improvement. This site has lots of images that don't change over time, little thumbnails here and there, and there are over 105 of them. And so you could imagine that spriting those into maybe 10 larger images and using CSS to slice and base it to show it up on the screen might actually improve their performance because you, would, you could potentially pull out uh, nearly 100 requests from the loading of the page. Um, so we'll move on. And so what makes a site really fast? And this is showing um, the, the breakdown of speed index on mobile sites. This is the count of, of sites. And you can see that we kind of peak somewhere around 8 and a half to 9, 8,500 8, to 9,000 speed index. And so what can we do to help make these sites faster? Um, one thing we can do is minimize the number of requests. So if we look at the speed index and rank, group all the, the sites in the HTTP archive by speed index, you can get the median on the number of requests. And it grows pretty much line, linearly out to about 20 seconds. And it continues to grow um, all the way out. I think the slowest site that I saw was it was really slow. It was about a second to load the entire site. It just gets very, very noisy because there's not as much data out for those very, very slow sites. But it does continue to grow. And so obviously the faster the sites, the faster sites generally have a lot fewer requests. And so another thing to look at is we, we looked at all the sites that have a speed index of under 2,000. And what we found is that all of these sites have no external render blocking resources. So there's no external CSS or JavaScript. So in a high latency environment like mobile, the 
um, the overhead of waiting for those external blocking resources does kill the performance. And so if we, we can actually look here, and this is a graph of uh, CSS requests grouped by the speed index. And so the, the numbers are pretty hard to see here. Um, but what you can see here is uh, this is in the x-axis you've got your uh, number of CSS, external CSS files that are requested. You've got the count on the y-axis. And then the blue line are sites that load in under, with a speed index of under 2,000. And so you can see sites under 2,000 generally have 0, 1, or 2 uh, external CSS files. When you get to 2 to 5, you can see that's in red. And we might go out to maybe there are a few that have 5 or 6, but the vast majority are still under two external CSS files. And if you go out to eight seconds, you can see the number has jumped out to one, two, three, all the way out to 11. And this trend continues. I didn't want to go too far because the graph becomes really ugly. But the slower sites, you can see the number of external CSS requests just continue to grow as sites get slower and slower and slower. Um, Another thing to look at is one way to speed traffic, speed the traffic to your site is to um, compress the files. So if the files are compressed, they download faster. And when they download faster, then the browser can render them in a, in a more performant way because the slowest part of this whole thing is transferring it from your server to the end user. So obviously compressing the files is going to make it come down to your customers a lot faster. And if you just look at the percent of HTML files that are gzipped um, for a site, and you graph that against speed index, it's really interesting. The fastest sites are somewhere around, you know, above 70% of the, of the files are, are gzipped. And the reason some of these are not gzipped is that they're, the HTML files are incredibly small. If they're incredibly small and smaller than one packet, gzipping it isn't going to really make things faster. But if you look, it just continues to drop until you get out to the very slow sites, and we're looking at almost somewhere around 40% of the, of the HTML files are gzipped, and it just drops very quickly. So one way to make your site faster is just to make sure that you're, you're making the file smaller. And then another thing to look at is, in addition to the number of requests, every time you go to a new domain, there's a new DNS lookup, which is another round trip. And you can see in the HTTP archive for mobile, we have sites hitting upwards of 60 domains um, just for a mobile web page. You know, the vast majority are probably under 5, under 10. But you can see that as you request more domains, and it does get very noisy, you can see the speed index increases as you add more and more domains, um, probably peaking out to about 15,000 after about uh, 15 or 20 uh, domain requests. So if you can reduce the number of domains that your site hits, you will also further speed up your site. Yeah, and one of the things we notice <clears throat> with all these graphs is, you know, as as we get to the extremes, as we get to sites that are using multiple, more CSS files than the rest and more domains, et cetera, we've got, we've got a smaller sample size. So the data gets noisier because there's far more variation going on. But, you know, it's, um, it's a, you know, a lot of this isn't rocket science. You know, we've known about specific um, text resources. We've known about reducing image sizes, uh, putting JavaScript at the bottom, you know, reusing connections and, and all these sorts of things. And despite this, we're, we're running into worrying trends. And this is the, the bit that sort of horrifies me every time I look at this data is that, you know, although, you know, our pages are still getting bigger and, you know, from 765K a year ago to 942 now, so the first of this month, um, so that's roughly a 25% increase in in our total pages we're expecting people to download. And 
you know, it's almost as if we we're expecting faster networks, better mobile devices to bail us out. But within these trends, there are some, there are some more worrying issues. So, you know, the base size of the page, the amount of HTML we're sending really hasn't changed that much. It would be, be interesting to see if all those people who haven't got GZIP on, if they turned it on, whether we could, you know, bring this transfer size down. But, you know, our base page isn't changing much. It's what we're putting in it that's changing. So, you know, the amount of JavaScript we've got and the, the size of the individual files is growing. And as JavaScript is render blocking, um, you know, this seems to be having one of the things that's having an impact on the visual performance. What we um, what we haven't got in this deck, but we we've started looking at as well is looking at how speed index is changing over time. So how is the perceived performance of the page is changing? And what we're seeing with that histogram we showed earlier is, you know, as these sites are getting bigger and getting more resources, then the performance of them is degrading over time. So one of the, some of the other things we'd like to do is look at how much of this JavaScript is in the head and how much is it downloaded async or in the in the foot of the page. But Unfortunately, we're, we're not at the point where the HTTP archive will give us that data yet, and we haven't gone scanning for ourselves yet. But so JavaScript is growing, and JavaScript may or may not be render blocking. But CSS is massively growing, and CSS, where the media queries apply, is a, a blocking resource. So this will, you know, delay this rendering of the page and give people a worse experience. Um, images as ever with most pages, are the bulk of our downloads. And they are growing. But we're also starting to get some solutions for the challenge of images. So with Picture and Source Set coming along, then maybe we'll get to position when enough people have deployed it so that you know images aren't growing so much. And the images we're delivering to mobile are well optimized for that device rather than a desktop image somebody's trying to use to cover all bases. Um, but, you know, we we tend to focus a lot on HTML and CSS and JavaScript and images in optimization work. And, you know, you'll quite often see a tweet with somebody talking about the size of this website on mobile, whether it's Oakley's 63 meg monster or whatever it was. And people focus on the images but and while that's important in terms of overall download size one of the key things about images is they they don't block rendering um, the page can carry on rendering while it's waiting for bits of images to appear but there's there's one resource that often the page may not be able to wait for and that's fonts and you know our font size or uh, has grown I say 300% here based on this chart, but this is an average. And we have to be really careful at looking at averages because when we actually plot it out, most mobile pages aren't using fonts. So, you know, of the 4,700 odd pages in the archive, 3,000 of them don't use any fonts at all. But then on the other hand, we get some pages that, you know, do download fonts and this was a desktop site. It's a Russian desktop site that somehow ended up in the archive, but they've got 1.7 megs of font. And I wouldn't be prepared to wait for that on a desktop, let alone um, in a mobile environment. But we do have sites that are meant for mobile that have roughly 500K of font files being downloaded. And these, in this situation, um, one of them blocks the page, one of them is loading them after the fact. And in these two sites, so, you know, Zendesk and VMware, um, they're using massive amounts of fonts to load. And you can physically see the effect it has when the page is loading. Um, Linode, in one of the test runs, had 500 K of fonts. Now they appear to be down to um, 100K, I believe it was. But you know, it's it's almost as if we've worried about our CSS and worried about our 
JavaScript and worried about the HTML size. But then we've got this new shiny tool um, and started using it without really thinking of the balance between the user experience and the niceties that the fonts bring. And this is NBC News when it comes up. So, you know, we when fonts originally came out, we let the browser render the page as it was and then overlaid the font over the top. But we decided this wasn't a very aesthetically appealing um, experience. So in Firefox, it will block for three seconds before deciding that the font's not going to arrive and renders the page in the default font. And then when the, the custom web font arrives, um, repaints the screen with it. Chrome is or is just about to do something similar. But this, in this example here, this is NBC News loaded on my mobile phone. This is actually a screenshot of my mobile phone. And you know there was a period of time where the site just wasn't usable to me. Um, but it doesn't have to be like this. We can still have our cake and eat it, so to speak. We can still use web fonts to get a nice aesthetic experience and you know, still have fast loading times. So probably one of the biggest and most well-known proponents of this approach is The Guardian. If I click the right box, you'll see it. Um, so one of the biggest proponents of this approach is The Guardian. So what The Guardian do is check is store their font in local storage and then they check whether the font's available on page load if it's in local storage and if it is they inject it into the page if um it's not available they lazy load it into the background in the background um and store it in local storage for next time um if you've ever looked at the indiephone.org site um that lara Kalbag builds you'll see that what she's done is it loads the default font and then she lazily loads the font they want to use afterwards you, you there's a slight change in visual um in the in, in the way that in as the page is repainted it, it changes slightly visually but it's it still makes the page usable really earlier on um there's the javascript font loading library um which helps and then finally we've got the font loading events api coming to browsers so you know we can we can have our fonts and still deliver a great user experience we just have to work a little bit harder at it but there's there's one last thing that i would like to cover on fonts and you know all too often we use the default font um as comes from foundry so this is google's open sans font and those are all the glyphs that are in it and by default it's 22k um but you know how many of these glyphs are we really going to use on our web pages and even by just subsetting it down to latin um, which is pretty easy to do with the google font library we can make a 33 percent saving and the magic thing about getting down to under 15k is you know if it's coming off google cdn where they've got an initial congestion window set to 10 then this should be retrievable in a single round trip and you know as we know, round trips are expensive, particularly on mobile. But we can be a bit more aggressive. If we want to cut down a bit further and just use the characters we want on our websites, we can make this font under 10K. We could make this font under 10K and, if necessary, stick it as a data URI in our CSS. So, you know, fonts are an area where we've not really pushed out the message about how to optimize the user experience, how to optimize for a fast visual loading time and it's something from a mobile perspective we need to concentrate more on and you know it'd be interesting to see how many other people as the as time develops how many people in the HTTP archive sort of um, start to adopt these techniques and use a more ag aggressive approach to delivering a great user experience so um, for those of you who've been on Twitter this afternoon Scott Gell's been talking about something like this where you know he's on this race to get the speed index for the filament group down as low as possible doing things like inlining css and one of the great things he did this afternoon was um in inlined the um font as a data uri
so to get rid of those external requests and yeah it, it pulled the speed index down to 300 and something i think and there are practically no other sites in the HTTP archive with a speed index that low so so moving uh slightly changing um Changing the, uh, the, the from going into the weeds of the HTTP archive and looking at specifics for different types of requests and files. And another thing that you can do with the HTTP archive and web page test is look at <coughs> design paradigms that are popular in mobile and compare them. See which are faster. See which ones use more kilobytes and more requests. And as an example here, what I'm going to show is comparing sites that use responsive web design versus sites that do a mobile redirect. And so there's a lot of stuff out there about responsive web design and how it, it has one site for all screens and it just uses media queries to change the layout based on screen size. And that's kind of the five second overview of a, of a very rich field of study in terms of building sites that work on all screens. And then there's the kind of the, the what would I would consider the traditional approach, which is serving a mobile specific site, a site that may have a subset of information, smaller images, and, and probably a lot lighter. And in the examples I'm going to show here, these are sites that do a redirect to something like m.website.com. And so we've gotten some lists. Some of our colleagues uh, uh, have, have provided us with lists that they've gone through and looked at responsive uh, figuring out lists of responsive websites, uh, GuyPod at Akamai has get, passed on a list, and I think uh, Andy has gotten a few lists as well, and Andy's put up a list on GitHub of, of all the responsive sites that, that, that we've discovered from that. And so just as an example, here is a, a responsive website, and it's an AT&T site just because that's easier. So if you can see as the screen gets bigger, the it changes what is shown on the screen. So this is kind of the mobile version and then sort of the tablet version. And then it changes for the website version. And then an example of a site that does a mobile redirect is, you know, this is the AT&T homepage. Um, when you look at the AT&T homepage on your browser, on your computer, it looks like this. When you, in this case, I was using Chrome and I was emulating a, an Android device. It redirected me to the m.att.com, and you can see it's a more simple layout. It's got these, you know, it's got menus. It's just a, it's a more simplified and smaller uh, version of the site. And so, using web page tests grabs all when you when the HTTP archive runs it, they run these tests, and we can then go and query and sort these sites as to what kind of sites that uh, we see. And so. We've done this two different ways. One is using the HTTP archive data using um, the, the older iPhone running the iOS 5. Um, and then we also, Andy, reran those same top 1,000 sites using the Moto G uh, running KitKat. And you can see that the numbers are fairly similar um, in terms of the count for mobile specific, the, the mobile redirect versus the responsive web. Uh, within within 10, which is pretty darn close. Uh, the number of requests are also very similar. So as you can see, responsive sites being that they are your uh, what you would consider a traditional website just being sized down for mobile, they tend to have a lot more requests, anywhere between 20 and 40% higher, depending on the device. Um, the kilobyte size, again, is similar for iOS versus versus Android. Um, again, the responsive websites are nearly 50% heavier than the, the mobile redirect sites. And that makes sense. The mobile redirect sites are designed to be lighter and, and to download uh, less data. But what I found very, very interesting was that the responsive sites and the, the mobile redirected sites actually have very similar speed index indices. I suppose. Um, what, what we see in this data is that this, even though 
the responsive sites have more requests and they have uh, more, more data, they actually load, according to speed index, about the same, which I found really interesting. And it could be just that the folks building the responsive sites are, are looking at some of the performance aspects of it. Um, but it, I, I thought it was really interesting to see that, that, that the load times is actually fairly similar versus a redirect and a responsive site. Uh, this is obviously an area that's ripe for a lot more exploration. As we're kind of scratching the surface here um, in this presentation. So, Andy, do you want to kick off the summary slide? Yeah. So, you know, in in summary, the the thing, the crucial things about making a mobile site fast are, you know, the things we've been encouraging people to do for a long time. You just have to do them a bit uh, more aggressively on mobile. So, it is about reducing file size. It is about reducing the number of requests, the number of domains. The, the big thing to watch and you can tell on this slide who was the English British guy who wrote part of this slide and who was the American guy by the spelling of optimize. But it's to watch the crystal, what's known as the crystal rendering path. And Patrick Hammond of the Guardian's got a great talk about this. In that, you know, when once the HTML has been downloaded, you know, and, and parsed into a DOM, then what happens is, you know, it goes off and request the CSS, any external CSS and build a CSS object model. And then it starts to, to merge the DOM and the CSS object model together to build a, a render tree. And, you know, it, it's only at that point where the render tree gets built and what um, which we know which styles are used that other resources referenced by CSS start to get downloaded. So things like background images and fonts and where fonts are identified, the browsers as we talked about, will hold rendering. So, you know, it's it's about making sure that what's in that critical rendering path is as optimized as, as much as it can be, so that the page starts to paint quicker and the people get a great experience. And then I suppose finally is, you know, the lines responsive design appears to be, you know, starting to deliver its promise when it's done well in the, you know, the lines between a mobile redirect, and, a, and the mobile redirect, of course, incurs a, a lot of latency. Um, so the, the lines between the mobile redirect and responsive design are starting to blur, but we still see plenty of responsive sites that are um, well oversized and, as Jason Grigsby would put it, obese for the devices we're delivering them to. Um, the other thing that we get to do is part of these webcasts, and we'll, we'll come on to people's questions in a minute, is, you know, um, Rick Viscomi, uh, myself, and Marcel Duran uh, working pretty hard on um, a book called Using Web Page Test, because, you know, we think Web Page Test is a great tool. Uh, some people know how to use it. Some people how to know how to use it on a basic level. It's got lots of great features. Some of the challenges with web page tests is you have to learn how to interpret the waterfall. So if we want to get people to build better mobile sites and test better mobile sites, we've got to teach them what they're seeing. Um, so using web page test, early release is coming out soon. Um, full release of the book is due in the autumn, and we cover everything from you know getting started, running your first tests, how to use it to script. So you can script a login process on a website, for example, or script a, a user journey so you can see how that loads and how effective the caching is throughout that. It's got an API so you can build it into your continuous integration processes and you know use it on a regular basis when you change code to you know run regular tests and see whether your performance is staying the same. And then finally you can install it yourself. It's a bit of fun and games but we're also going to cover that as well. So that's coming out later in the year. Um, we finished the main part of our talk, and so I guess it's time for questions. All right, folks. We are now at the Q&A portion of the event, and um, Doug and Andy, we have several questions that have come in. Are you able to see them? Yep, I've got them. Super. We'll turn it back to you. 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to take Jason's question about um, creating a, a subset of web fonts. Um, the where I did m my uh, tests on web fonts is I, I was using the Google font, which um, are quite popular across a lot of sites, and um, what what you can do there is when you specify the the, CS, the CSS to go in and you specify the fonts in the CSS, um, there's I think it's a subset parameter, so you can specify a subset of Latin, for example, or you can specify text equals and give it an actual text string to um, render into the font, um, and that will produce the subsetted font. Um, what you can do then, and what I I know some of my customers do, is Having generated the fonts that way using the CSS, they actually then um, take the URLs for the fonts that have been generated and embed those straight in their font face uh, declarations in their CSS so that they don't have the overhead of requesting that CSS sheet from Google and then getting having to make another request to get the font files. They can just go straight from their CSS files to the font files directly. Um, some of the other uh, font foundries have subsetting facilities. I haven't found it for others as well. It's something I'm planning to do a bit more research on and, and dig it out because I think it is well worth doing as a performance improvement. Doug, do you want to pick a question? Sure. There is a question here. Does AT&T treat mobile web HTTP traffic any differently than any other data in terms of optimization and priority? And um, you know, I'm not a network guy at AT&T or one of the thousands of network guys and gals at AT&T, um, but I would say that we, you know, we, tr we treat traffic as traffic. So I don't think there are any, there's no optimization being done on our network. So what is sent is sent. Um, you know, there, there, there were times, and I don't think AT&T ever did it, but other wireless networks did try to do, set up proxies to optimize traffic. Um, we don't do that. Um, and in terms of priority, it, it, traffic is traffic. So as it comes through, it, it just comes through, is, is my understanding. But again, I'm not that guy at at and I guess I should probably take some of the other fun questions. Um, so uh, Craig, no, I don't know if there are any legal issues if you host Google's fonts on your own server. Um, it's probably worth something worth checking with one of the Chrome Dev advocates, um, so like Paul Kindlern or Paul Lewis or Ilya or the other Paul Irish, because um, some of the Google fonts are open source anyway. Um, but to answer your question, no, I don't know any more on that. Um, the other. Uh, point that somebody makes that uh, Bernard makes about the Guardian's approach of storing uh, fonts in local storage um, and people at the HTML5 comp not being too impressed about that. It's yeah, it's storing stuff in um, people store stuff in local storage because we don't trust the browser cache. Um, as developers, we have little control over the browser cache, we can decide or we can declare how long a browser cache can store it, but we've got no guarantees how long it's ever going to be there. And particularly with you know, mobile devices that are memory constrained um, and have small caches, then you know, there's a likelihood they're going to get evicted more often. And so our files don't live there as long. So what we've sort of taken to do is using things like IndexedDB, and local storage um, as a cache we can control. But there are challenges in that. So, you know, what happens when every mobile developer uses local storage to store their files and the phone runs out of space? We've, we've taken something that the end user didn't really have to worry about and we've, we've made managing our cache on their device their concern instead of doing it for them. So, yeah, I, from an engineering point of view, I appreciate beauty of storing fonts in local storage. Um, from it's, I think it's only a temporary solution. I think 
the more people that do it, the more we will give our users problems. Um, but I don't know the solution at this point in time. I, you know, I don't know whether things like service worker will help us manage this in a more sane way. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure how we, how we do that. So there's a question here on how speed index is calculated. And let's see if I can push to this slide here. Let's see if I can make that happen. All right, so we're going back to the beginning of the presentation. And this is a timeline of screenshots being taken by the web page test. And what we're doing is we're looking at how much of the web page is painted over time. And so you can see right here between zero and one second, most of the screen has gone from white to being painted. Whereas from zero to one seconds here, we've only got the headers. And you know, anyone who's spent a lot of time browsing on mobile websites has seen web pages that sit and hang out here for a long time. And it's a little bit aggravating and it's slow because you know, the icon of the website you're visiting is, is rather beautiful and the, the different you know, places you can browse on the site is beautiful, but you're really there for what you want down here at the bottom of the screen. And so what we're doing is, you know, if we want to go to calculus, you're kind of integrating the space over time that is that it has been painted. So here, it painted really fast, and so we have a speed index of 1,200, being that on the first view and repeat views, the most of the screen is painted at 1.2 seconds. This one took a lot longer, and it took about nine seconds for the entire for all the meat of the page, the part that you interact with, to actually load onto the screen. But the other thing is, um, if you go to webpagetest.org and go to the documentation, there's a pretty in-depth description of the way um, speed index is calculated. And in theory, if you've got any uh, film strip of a web page loading, you can calculate a speed index from it. There are also other ways you can do it by just looking at the paint rectangles um, on a screen. So you could, in theory, get a Chrome, uh, a timeline out of Chrome DevTools and use that to build uh, a speed index, although I've not seen anybody do that. But yeah, the best place for the in-depth dis um, description of how it's calculated is go to webpagetest.org and look at the um, documentation. Um, so I'll take Brett's question. So um, web page test can capture um, multiple steps in a flow. Um, it's through its scripting ability, which isn't always the most obvious um, thing in the world. Um, and it, it, it sort of varies a bit between what different browsers support. But scripting ability is only available on desktop devices. Um, none of the mobile agents currently support scripting, but you can do the login, search, um, view results, sort of things. And if you, if you want to do it in a in a pseudo mobile environment, um, Web Chrome Web Page Test has this option for Chrome, where what you can do is say emulate mobile device and it changes the request header to be from a mobile device. It alters the screen size um, down to a mobile viewport. It reports it as having higher DPI. So there are, there are ways you can emulate um, a scripted session on a mobile device, but it, it's not ideal yet. Uh, do you want to take a question, Doug? Sure. There's another question here, um, waiting for my QA to reload. But it was talking about looking at CPU usage of, of your mobile device while a web page is loading. And I uh, can't do that in with web page tests. Um, there are tools out there that do look at CPU usage. Uh, Qualcomm has an excellent tool called uh, Trepin that you can download, and it, it shows you how your CPU is working over time as you load different things. Um, uh, AT&T, we've got a free tool called the Application Resource Optimizer, and it looks at network traffic, how the, um, 
how the GPS is being used, how the CPU is being used. So you could load a page and see uh, CPU usage over time from the Android from from the Chrome browser, or the Android browser that you're that you're testing with. Yeah, I'll take uh, Bernard's question on this is all initial views. Yes, we all this testing is based on the initial view of the the web page, um, and yeah, we've we've done some work to look at what happens when you reload the pages. We did when I did the thousand. Um, URL test on Chrome. Uh, we captured the repeat views so we could look at what the caching behavior is. We haven't got around to that yet, but some of the things that are really sort of in, important to remember with caching on mobile is, are, is the caches are small, um, so stuff does get regularly evicted. Um, it's probably really good for when you're on a website and you go through a series of pages, um, but then when you leave and come back several hours later, it's unclear how much of that stuff is in your cache. And you know, before we have any cached content on a page, we first have to make a first view. And if we're too slow making that first view, then you know we're never going to get the opportunity to make the repeat view that uses the cache. Do you want to do the redirect question, Doug? Sure. Um, I actually don't know. Do you know the answer to that one? Um, it's it's depending on the redirect type, isn't it? Some redirects are cacheable and some aren't. It's whether the redirect is a permanent redirect, um, which is where I've got to remember if it's a 301 or 302, and embarrassingly, I can't do that right now. Um, 301, but, that, I, that I do know. <laughs> yeah, so permanent redirects are cacheable, temporary redirects aren't. Um, the ways we can there are also things you can do you can issue cache directives with redirects so you could say if you're somebody's doing an adaptive design where they're redirecting based on the type of device or serving content specific to a device type you can use uh cache control private so that no proxy caches cache it but you know um permanent redirects are cacheable The record I've seen, and Andy, I don't know what you've seen, but in terms of number of redirects on a mobile on a mobile site, I've seen seven. I'm on about four is the most I've seen. But you know, in um, Ilya Grigoric talks about a, a, has a, a talk called "A Thousand Milliseconds Time to Glass," where he talks about what's required to basically get a page to load in a second on mobile. And Ilya makes the quote in that that. You know, you just don't have time to do a redirect because if we're operating on, you know, half a second of latency, just doing that redirect, you know, consumes most of your available time to get an experience on the page really quickly. Um, Bill's asked a question about is there much variation noticed in page load time of HTTPS versus HTTP only pages? Um, yeah, HTTPS pages are generally always slower, um, and there's a there's a couple things uh, behind that. One is um, the extra round trips involved in negotiating um, the cipher to use and exchange certificates. Um, and you know, when you're on HTTPS, you have to negotiate that the initial host you're talking to for when resources are coming from other domains then you know each of those has to be negotiated with as well and you know HTTPS is one of the things where we're getting better at optimizing it um, but it's not as good as we could be it's when I look at pages it's often we see that you know the origin page the, the site owners optimize their page really well but when you look at the resources they start to bring in from third parties, so some ad networks, some analytics, A/B testing networks. Is some of them aren't as well optimized, and you know this has a big impact on the overall, you know, user experience. 